Splint Studio can help you design and create a stabilization splint with anterior guidance for the upper jaw. In this video, we'll show you the workflow to achieve such a splint. On the order form in Dental Desktop, select any tooth in the upper jaw in the overview window, and then Appliance, and then Splint. Remember to choose In-house to do the production in your lab. Next, proceed with scanning or import the scans. Move further when done. Firstly, from the drop-down menu, you can also select which machine and material you want to produce your splint with. The machine selection will apply the manufacturer's recommended manufacturing values for the machine and material combination. Now, define the occlusal plane by placing three points on the scan, following the prompts that appear in the Hints window. This will make sure that the model will be placed correctly in the virtual articulator. Use the control points to adjust the plane until you are satisfied. To make sure that the occlusal plane has been set correctly, making the antagonist visible and examining from the lingual view may help. Please note that in cases where the first molars are missing as reference points, you may use other available teeth to mimic the corresponding position and further adjust the plane to correct the placement. Move further when done. At the bite configuration step, you can open the bite using the incisal pin and adjust the incisal table angulation to create customized anterior guidance for the splint. Make sure that the jaws are correctly positioned in the articulator by using the control points. To help you do this, there are a few useful tools. The teeth outlines on the default plane can help you adjust position by aligning the model with the outlines. The tilt and height position of the jaws can be adjusted by using the control spheres. By left-clicking on either jaw, you can activate it and change its position individually. Note that changing the jaw relations should be done extremely carefully. In this case, we will adjust the virtual articulator settings to help produce the anterior guidance ramp for the splint. First, enable Guide by Incisal Table. In the Articulator Settings tab, you may adjust the incisal table angulation to create a customized incisal guidance for the articulation. In the example case, we will use 15 degrees of angulation for all movements. To ensure sufficient interocclusal clearance for the stabilization splint, we'll use the opening of incisal pin value to increase the distance between the jaws. In this example case, an opening of 8.5 mm results in 1.7 mm of interocclusal clearance in static occlusion. Another way to achieve the same result is to also use the interocclusal clearance tool to automatically open the bite in a certain minimum thickness. The software will make sure that the given value in millimeters is the minimum one in static occlusion. After this, you'll have to adjust the incisal pin back into contact with the table should you want to use incisal pin guidance for the virtual articulator. You can check the adequacy of the opening by checking the interocclusal clearance tool in the articulator tab. In many cases, a value between 1 to 2 millimeters is sufficient to ensure the minimum thickness of the splint is met in dynamic articulation. When satisfied, use the lock jaw position tool to lock the jaws in position. Clicking the 2D cross-section tool will allow you to check if interocclusal clearance is sufficient for the splint. To do this, look at the model from the top and draw a line so that you can see both sides of the dentition in the cross-section panel. Use the control points to move or rotate the plane if needed. Now, find the narrowest point of the cross-section and take a measurement to check it. Then run articulation. As the jaws are moving, it may turn out that the bite may not be opened enough to accommodate for the minimum thickness required. When satisfied, move on further. In this step, the insertion direction is proposed automatically by the software. 
If you would like to change it, rotate the model as if looking at the scan from the direction that the splint would be put on the jaw. Press the From View button, and this new insertion direction will be calculated. The insertion direction can also affect the possible retentiveness of the splint. By adjusting the direction, you can control the location and volume of the undercut areas. If a notification saying that the model has tunnels or holes appears, it is advisable to press Correct, as this ensures that further design steps are not hindered by possible problems on the surface of the scan. You can now adjust the retentiveness of the splint. All the coloured areas are undercuts. When the Perform Undercuts Removal option is enabled, it will block the splint from going into an undercut area. If you disable this option, the undercuts will still be shown, but the splint will not be automatically blocked from going into those areas. By changing the retention value, you can decide how much the occlusal splint is allowed to go into an undercut area. In the wax trimming step, you can apply wax to protect potentially sensitive areas in the patient's mouth from direct contact with the splint's inner surface, as contact may cause discomfort or irritation to the patient. For example, the ruga, papilla incisiva, incisal edges, and the gum line. Wax can also be applied to block out and safeguard fixed retainers, tooth jewelry, and fragile structures. Blockout wax should also be applied on surfaces with missing scan data, for example holes or scan artifacts. Note that you can use the Smooth tool by left-clicking the mouse button and smoothing any areas. The Smooth tool allows for the adding of relief wax in a controlled way, using the surface normals of the scan. For a stronger effect, the Add tool can be applied in a desired strength and diameter. You can also use the Add and Smooth tools to apply extra wax relief into sharp fissures and interproximal areas to significantly facilitate the seating of the splint. In this step, you can also add retention locally. For example, retention can be acquired from undercut areas from both the buccal and palatal sides of the patient's teeth. This can be done bilaterally, for example, from the canines, the first premolars, or first molars. Use the Remove tool to remove some blockout wax in those areas. The color scale informs you how much depth the local retention area has. When satisfied, press Next to go further. Now it is time to draw the splint outline. You can add points or hold down the left mouse button and draw a line. You can start your outline in various places, for example, starting from the last molar. The outline needs to be completed by connecting the last point to the starting point of the spline. Please note that in cases where you chose to acquire retention locally, it is crucial to draw the outline through the desired retention areas. You can edit the spline at any time. In the case presented here, the outline is drawn following the prominence line over the local retention areas. The incisal edges are covered with approximately 1 to 1.5 millimeters of material, and on the palate, the outline is scalloped following the gingival margin at a 0.5 to 1 millimeter distance. Behind the maxillary incisors, the distance is slightly increased. Now you can also adjust the splint thickness and set the minimum thickness. The latter will ensure that the minimum thickness value is enforced wherever it is not possible to maintain the general thickness value. The software notifies you in case of minimum thickness violations. Minimum thickness will depend on the specific machine manufacturing process selected. The offset from teeth to splint directly affects the fitting of the splint. We recommend it to be more than 0 mm. The drill diameter is set when using a milling machine instead of a 3D printer. When you are satisfied with placement of the outline, move on to further steps. At the raised surface step, you can create surfaces that will form the outer geometry of the occlusal splint. 
When designing a stabilization splint with flat planes on the posterior areas, a good tool to start with is the raised to antagonist cusp tips. Use the selector by holding the left mouse button down and dragging the cursor over posterior teeth areas in two sections. The follow cusp tip radius in this case is set between 8 to 12 millimeters to keep the surface flat. A preview of the splint geometry with given values appears after each change. In case you prefer to have stronger indentations to mark the contact points, you can use a lower value. However, this will result in more manual sculpting in later steps. To establish anterior guidance with immediate posterior disclusion, an appropriate volume of material can be generated in the anterior region of the splint. One way of doing this is to use the raise ramp selector for the remaining anterior area, from K9 to K9. The ramp angle setting allows you to change how slanted the splint surface will be in comparison to the occlusal plane. In this case we needed to use a ramp angle of 30 degrees to build up more volume for the anterior ramp. Please be aware that if you find the raise ramp functionality does not produce the desired geometry for your case, it is possible to use the raise to antagonist plane tool which will enable you to set an antagonist plane position that the surface of the splint will then meet. You can also choose to leave areas unselected, which will result in a generic offset from the scanned surface in the previously defined splint thickness. When satisfied with your design, you can move further on. At the Adapt Design step, pop-up notifications may appear during various stages of design adaptation. You can always choose to let the software make corrections automatically, or you can do it by yourself and press Accept. The software indicates the problem area when pressing the I icon. By enabling the distance map, you can see where potential contacts will emerge. It is recommended to add some material to the spots where the intended point contacts are supposed to be, until you see red collision lines. The distance map only shows proximity, not contacts. That means you have established a contact with the splint surface. The contacts will be adjusted in the next steps. They can be left strong. The numeric value depicts how much contact violation occurs. A standard sculpting operation is advisable at this stage. Use the smooth tool to level sharp edges or transition lines. Also, you can remove material in all areas that are not relevant for the splint type. This will help with the adaptation stage later. Add a considerable bulk of material around the K9 to K9 region, using the antagonist as a reference point. The idea of the added material is to provide the support for the K9 and anterior guidance. This will be automatically adapted by the articulator. At this stage, it's important to establish the centric stops, or static contact points, to get the desired function from the splint. Repeat the following procedure whenever material has been added or removed in the proximity of static contact points, to make sure no unintended material is affecting the splint function. To do so, enable Guide by Incisal Pin, and make sure that Guide by Design is disabled. Then lock both lateroctrusion and mediotrusion, and retrusion and protrusion. Now enter a value of 0 0.01 millimeters in the Adapt Design field, and run articulation. Then press Adapt Design. To check, you can now set the Adapt Design value to 0, and rerun articulation. You should now see collision lines of equal strength from all occluding teeth. Now it's time to create anterior guidance, which means that the protrusive disclusion will be guided by the lower incisors, and the lateroobtrusive disclusion will be guided by the lower canines. To do so, make sure that Guide by Incisal Pin is enabled, and unlock all the articulator movements, then run articulation. If enough material has been added, then you should now see blue marks indicating a collision between the splint surface and the antagonist in lateral otrusion, and also black marks indicating protrusive movement. It is now necessary to adapt the splint surface to achieve the desired function of the splint. 
The first action to take is to select the Area Selection Mode button. Now paint the area on the splinch surface that is being antagonized by the lower incisors. Use the antagonist to guide you. Then run articulation again and adapt design. The selected area will not be affected by the adaptation. As a result, you'll now see canine guidance slopes on the splint surface. Now select the Area Selection Mode button again and then click the Next icon to remove any currently selected areas. Then make sure that lateral Otrusion and Mediotrusion is locked and ensure that Retrusion Protrusion is unlocked. Then run Articulation and adapt the design. Following this, make sure that Guide by Incisal Pin is disabled and ensure that Guide by Design is enabled. Check that both lateral Otrusion and Mediotrusion and Retrusion and Protrusion are unlocked and run Articulation to see the dynamic occlusion and what the contact patterns look like. Lateral Otrusion and Mediotrusion contacts are green and blue and Retrusion and Protrusion contacts are black. You will most likely find that the canines are not guiding the lateral Otrusion disclusion. To create canine guidance, you'll need to add material gently to the lateral Otrusion slopes, bilaterally, until the desired disclusion is achieved. It is common to see the lateral incisor forming a contact alongside the canine. This can often be discluded by adding material to the canine's lateral Otrusion slope. Run the articulation after adding material to see the effect on the contact pattern. After the canine guidance is sculpted, at this stage it's important to once again establish the centric stops or static contact points as we do not wish to unintentionally increase the interocclusal clearance. After establishing the static contacts, make sure that Guide by Incisal Pin is disabled and that Guide by Design is enabled. And make sure that both Lateral Otrusion and Mediotrusion and Retrusion and Protrusion are unlocked before running Articulation again. Repeat this procedure whenever material has been added or removed around the static contact points. You should see incisors forming the protrusive contact pattern. Please note that an incisor heavily below the general occlusal plane can also be left out of the main contact pattern, as long as the other incisors are contacting the splint surface. You can add or remove material to strengthen or weaken the contact pattern induced by each antagonizing tooth, smooth out or remove any contact patterns resulting from unwanted teeth. The key point to remember is that it is a process of adding, removing and smoothing, along with running articulation to assess the impact that will help you with adapting the design to your desired outcome. Running the articulation after each sculpt action gives you immediate feedback on the effect of the changes made. To check if the splint is going to work properly at the final sculpt step, make sure that Guide by Design is enabled and ensure that Guide by Incisal Table is disabled. Now the movements will be guided by the splint's geometry. You can now check that the posterior disclusion is guided by the canines in lateral Otrusion and by the incisors in Protrusion. When satisfied with your design, move further on. At the production preparation step, it is possible to put an ID tag on the splint. For cases intended for long-term use, consider whether the tag should be engraved, as that could create a plaque retentive surface. When you're satisfied with the outcome, press Next. Finally, the design splint STL file should be saved to a designated output folder for production. Now you have learned about the workflow for the stabilization splint with anterior guidance for the upper jaw.